morning and welcome to our time of worship as we start to think and prepare for our annual self-denial appeal the time of year when in the Salvation Army around the world people give in for the international work of the Salvation Army and this year in particular that focuses on projects that help with the sustainability of people and that helps to self-guard futures in the wake of extreme weathers um, and the like, things that are caused by global warming because we are not looking after our planet as well as perhaps we might be. It's God's creation. It's important that we care for it and that we care for each other in the effects of what has been going on. I'm reading from the first book of Kings, chapter 17, um, from verse 7 to 16. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as your, the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son so that we might eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Amen.
first book of Kings, we read of a succession of kings of Judah and Israel who, to quote the author, aroused the anger of the Lord. They were violent. They led the people of God in the worship of worthless idols. And each king in turn is described as being worse than the one who preceded him. And then came Ahab, the worst of the lot. 1 Kings 16, 32 to 33 tells us that Ahab set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he bought, built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. And it was this time that God spoke first through one of the greatest of the prophets, Elijah, who told Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. This wasn't to be the sort of drought that sends us into hosepipe bands or being told to have showers rather than baths. This was the kind of long-lived, life-threatening drought that we see incurring in places like Ethiopia and other countries, including some very rich Western nations, where there's no rain for years and as a consequence nothing grows. The water sources completely dry up and people begin to starve to death. Think of those news articles we see with tiny children bloated from malnutrition or the requests from help from charities like UNICEF and you'll get the picture. That's what Elijah told Ahab would happen. It would be a major catastrophe such as many people including our fellowship salvationists across the world suffer all too often. Even Elijah needed help in the midst of this crisis. Initially, God sent ravens to him with food and he was able to drink from a small brook until that too dried up. And that led Elijah on a journey. <clears throat> One Kings tells us that God told him to go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, where a widow had been instructed by God to give him food. Now, what that account doesn't tell us is that the journey was in the region of a hundred miles. That took tremendous faith. We're not told anything about that journey, but we can imagine it wouldn't have been easy. Because of the drought, we can imagine the paths would have been extremely dusty and we can see that they were also very hilly. Elijah would have suffered with the hunger and thirst like everyone else and would have been physically weak and tired. It was a journey of waiting, a journey of uncertainty but a journey filled with the presence of a faithful God who ensured that the woman was there picking up her sticks for a fire just as he had said at exactly the right time, the time that Elijah finally reached the end of that journey. Would we have had that same confidence in God's word and in his provision to go through with that journey and the expectation of a promise fulfilled at the end of it? Elijah did have that confidence and that was rewarded when he finally arrived at his destination where, just as God had told him, he found a widow picking up sticks. Although she had so little left, just enough to make herself and her son one last very basic meal with no hope of anything after that, she believed what the stranger told her about his God. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make yourself something for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. As God has promised, so it happened. And her generosity and that jar of flour and jug of oil fed the three of them until the end of the time of drought. God multiplied and blessed what had been so willingly given out of her poverty. Hundreds of years later, Jesus was a guest at a wedding. Now maybe the guests were super thirsty 
or maybe the host had underestimated what had been required, but the wine for the guests had run out. This was a drought of a very different kind, and it was the faith of another woman that resulted in a miracle, as Mary showed confidence in what her son Jesus could do to remedy a difficult situation for their host. She turned to her son and said, they have no more wine. We read this in John chapter 2. She also told the servants to follow the instructions of Jesus, which they did, even though the request would have been very strange to them. Fill the jars with water. They then took some of the contents of the jars to the master of the banquet, who tasted it and realised it was now wine of the very best quality, far better than the wine that had already been served to the wedding guests. This was a clear demonstration that, for Jesus, nothing but the best was good enough. He never gave half measures or crumbs in his relationships with others, but fulfilled his father's purposes with generosity and love in whatever he was doing. And through that, God was glorified. In each of these stories and situations, what was given was the very best. And in both cases, human expectations were turned on their heads. The widow expected to die of starvation and could have hung on to the little she had out of fear and desperation. The wedding host expected to be humiliated and shamed when the wine ran out and his servants could have refused to do what was asked of them. Yet, in each case, the reality was a situation transformed by faith in God's provision. We live in a world of interdependence and connectivity with each other. If COVID has demonstrated nothing else, it has shown the dangers to our well-being of isolation and loneliness. Being together again when that was finally possible meant so much to so many people. But that goes far beyond our immediate family and friends. In a global economy, we're all dependent on everyone else. What happens today on the other side of the world can affect us here tomorrow with empty shelves in our shops, increased oil and gas prices and so on. What we do here today can affect other people on this other side of the world with drought, rising sea levels and a threat to their very livelihoods. Yet the Bible demonstrates to us the love and provision of our Creator God, who asks us to trust Him and to live in connectivity with His worldwide family. We are invited to open our hands to each other, living in gratitude to Him and generosity to others. Jesus taught that the Kingdom of Heaven is ours when we turn to Him. What an abundance of blessings that is. It's something that gives us hope. It is the promise of a new creation, of God at work in our lives and in our world. God worked in Elijah's life, bringing him hope through the food brought by the ravens and the generosity of the widow of Zarephath. God then later used Elijah to repay that generosity by reviving her son when he became ill and died. God then provided at the wedding through Jesus' miracle of the water into wine. And he provides for us day by day, supremely through the death of Jesus on the cross, his resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In turn, we need to respond to him by listening to his voice and obeying with generosity and love. As we begin to prepare our gifts for this year's self-denial altar service in four weeks' time, we need to be ready to apply these same principles to our own personal giving to the work of the Salvation Army around the world. When we look at the Salvation Army world map, we can see that we are well situated to be able to help people in many, many places around the world because the Salvation Army is at work there already. There are soldiers and adherents and friends of the Salvation Army just like us who live in many of these places 
where extreme weather conditions are often to take place and happen. And we seek to help them to become more resilient, better prepared to face everything the world throws at them. In these days of climate change, it's essential that people who live in the most vulnerable areas get the help that they need to put structures in place to enable them to be able to feed and shelter themselves and their children and to help others. And this can be done through the training and skills the Salvation Army is able to provide because of our funding of the projects. It's not just a matter of providing infrastructure and training for people in need, however important that is, that our generous giving brings signs of hope and of a new creation, signs that God truly is at work all over the world. The woman from Zarephath was challenged by the need of a stranger from a foreign land who asked her to make him a loaf of bread out of her tiny resources. She could have held on to what she had, but was totally unselfish in her giving and as a result came to know the richness of God's blessing. We too should feel challenged by the needs of people from foreign lands who rely on our giving of our resources. Yes, we could choose to hold on to what we have, to give very little to, for those that we can make a big difference for by being generous. And that's what God calls us on to do, to be generous, so that they and ourselves in turn will know his richest blessings also. It is a real challenge, but may we have the faith to believe that God will bless us as we plan to bless others with our giving. Amen. Only